My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I welcome you to the 63rd class of our in-depth Bible study series. And today we will talk about Israel. So since the fresh breakout of war in Israel, all the people's eyes are on the war. And we see about this war in all the newspapers almost on the headlines and in the global section we see almost whole page covers about Israel and also we are getting posts through WhatsApp and Facebook and other social media about asking people to pray for Israel and posts about God will never leave Israel, the enemies of Israel will be destroyed and so on and so forth. Well, the situation which was at the beginning in which Israel was attacked by the terrorist groups and many civilians were killed and taken hostage and all was quite surprising and shocking. But later on, the response Israel has been giving upon Gaza, the world opinion is now changing. There are more supporters today for the Palestinian people than for Israel. And many Christians are torn between the two. Should we pray for Israel, the people of Israel, or should we pray for the people in Gaza? And one question again comes back to mind for many Christians. And that question is, are the Jews still God's chosen people today? We all know that they were God's chosen people in the past. But after they rejected Jesus, are they still God's chosen people? Now that's the question we're going to address in today's particular message. And of course, in the forthcoming classes, we will have more to say about the present situation. Well, are the Jews the chosen people of God even today. Brothers and sisters, the question is asked because, first of all, the Jews never accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Even after all these years of evangelical efforts, the vast majority of the people of Israel will never consider Jesus as the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. In fact, they not only deny that Jesus is the Messiah, they even disrespect him. They mock at Christians and the cross, and some of them even hate Jesus. In a shocking video I've seen, when the Jews are taking a procession and suddenly some Christians come with a cross, they turn and spit on them. Both the young and elderly, they spit on them and go. So that is the situation of the people of Israel today. Even though they maintain all the important Christian sites, and that they do because They get a lot of revenue from people who visit Israel from all over the world. Over 3 million people visit Israel every year and they want to make full use of that because they benefit from that. But yet they do not respect Jesus or accept Jesus as the Messiah. And that apart, talking about their lifestyle also today, It is more like how the very worldly people in the Western countries are. How America or Germany or France is in terms of uh, their lifestyle. Even Israel is the same. Let it be drinking or fornicating or indulging in homosexual activity also. This is very freely practiced in Israel. In fact, there are so many gay parades that take place in Israel every year. And also, the old as well as the young 
they just want to enjoy life as all other people of the world they do not even fear jehovah as per the old testament let alone accepting jesus and the new testament they do not live by the laws given by jehovah in the old testament excepting a very few small percentage of those who call themselves ultra orthodox jews the rest of the people of israel they live a sinful life and even when the attack took place on the 7th of october they attacked a group of youngsters who were involved in all night rave party there were hundreds of them there with loud music and drinking and dancing and usually drugs are also taken in this rave parties and that's where they were attacked and many were killed also so that is the lifestyle of the people of israel today so seeing all this from the christian perspective do we really have to pray for such people and to think that they are god's chosen people that is the question well christians are divided on this matter and we have three views on this subject theological opinion on this and we will look at all these three and we will clearly understand what the scriptures say about this matter whether the jews or god's chosen people today the number one doctrine is called the replacement theology according to this line of thought the jews were once god's chosen people but since jesus christ came and they rejected jesus god has cast them off and in their place god has taken christians as the spiritual israelites so what they say is that jews are no longer the chosen people they were once the chosen people but now they are no longer god's chosen people now christians are god's israel that christians are the spiritual israelites and all the promises and blessings belong to the christians so that is called the replacement theology well brothers and sisters there are many scriptural bases for those who hold this view also we will look up that uh, in the bible we know that jews were god's chosen people as we see in deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 where god says for thou art a holy people unto the lord thy god the lord thy god hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth so god through moses is telling the people that they were the chosen people above all the people that are on the face of the earth so that is very clear they were god's chosen people in the past but when you come to the new testament we turn to first peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 we read like this but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people that you should show for the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light and in verse 10 which in time past were not a people but are now the people of god which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy so this peter is speaking to not the jews but to the christians if you can just look up in the first chapter to whom this letter was addressed to we read peter an apostle of jesus christ to the strangers scattered throughout pontius galatia keper dacia asia and bithynia and then he says elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father through the sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of jesus christ grace and peace be to you so he's talking to the christians 
who were sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. To all the strangers scattered in Britannia and Galatia and Asia and so on and so forth. This was not addressed to the people of Israel. So he's talking about them and he's saying, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation and so on and so forth. So this uh, is the basis for those who hold on to that replacement doctrine and they say that we are the chosen people now because we have accepted Christ and God has now made us the royal priesthood and his special people. So that is what we see. And there are more scriptures in which Paul also clearly explains to us the importance of faith and spiritual status than the natural state of being born to Abrahamic lineage. That is very clearly seen in Galatians chapter 3 verses 7 to 9. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now what he is saying is, those who are of faith, they are the children of Abraham, he says. Not those who do not have faith, but those who have faith, they are the children of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel at Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations of the world will be blessed. So, verse 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So here very clearly saying, we become Abraham's children by our faith. Though we are not physically descended from Abraham, yet because we have faith, we are Abraham's children. And this is what God foresaw and he spoke concerning the heathen. So the heathens are children of Abraham now and that is what God referred to when he spoke to Abraham, Paul is saying to us. Uh, and of course, he continues to speak about the seed. And in our last class, we had four classes on the seed of woman, the seed of Abraham and all that. In that we took a detailed view on this particular verse. And that is uh, what we find in verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed was the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So when God made the promise to Abraham that in his seed all the nations will be blessed and so on and so forth, he was referring to one particular seed and that seed is Christ, he says. So, Jesus Christ is the real seed God was speaking of. The promised seed was Jesus. Here it says Christ. And in that Christ, as we have already seen in our previous class, that seed has head as Jesus and the church is the body of the seed. So, even the church is included in that seed that we very clearly see in verse 26 to verse 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. See, speaking to Gentiles and saying, because of your faith in Jesus, ye are the children of God, he says. And then verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Then verse 16 he said, the promise was made unto one particular seed and here he is saying that you have put on Christ when you are baptized into Christ. That means you become part of Christ. And then when we do that, when we believe in him, that is have faith in him, we become the children of God. And when we are baptized in his name, we put on Christ Jesus. And verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now he's saying, now it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Greek, 
whether you are born or free male or female all that doesn't matter and what matters here is that you believe jesus and you are baptized into him once you have faith in him you become a child of god and you become part of the christ the seed and then in the next verse he goes on to say and if you be christ then you are abram's seed and heirs according to the promise he is saying if you are christ that is through baptism if you belong to christ if you put on christ then ye are abram's seed and heirs of the promise so very clearly these verses assure us that by faith we are children of abraham by faith we are the seed of abraham so this is what refers to the christians the jews they don't have faith in christ they are not baptized into christ now how they can still be god's chosen people that is the point based on all these scriptures well brothers and sisters that is uh, more clearly emphasized to us in the same book in chapter 6 verse 16 in which paul calls christians as the israel of god see that in verse 16 of chapter 6 and as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy and upon the israel of god there you see is calling those who walk according to this rule and what rule is that that a person become a new creature it's not because of uh, any physical circumcision but a person when he accepts christ he becomes a new creature that's what we read in verse 15 for in christ jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature there is he is talking about a new creature so circumcision or not being circumcised doesn't count in this all that matters is a person has become new creature and then he says and as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy upon the israel of god so only many christians claim that we are the israel of god we are the spiritual israelites so we are the chosen people not those who rejected him not those who crucified him not those who refused to accept him but those who believe they are God's children they are Abraham's children they are the heirs of the promise and so on and they also have other scriptures to back them up which is very strong indeed like in philippians chapter 3 verse 3 it says we are of the circumcision who worship by the spirit of god and glory in christ jesus and put no confidence in the flesh he says we are such as of the circumcision who worship in the spirit he says even jesus said those who worship god should worship him in spirit and in truth so spiritually we are worshiping god and we glory in christ jesus and we have no confidence in the flesh so we don't believe in anything done in the fleshly way but we worship god in the spirit he says and then of course in romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 it talks about the importance of the spiritual circumcision or being inwardly circumcised than the outward physical circumcision in 228 and 29 for he is not a jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh so he is saying he is not a jew which is one outwardly that is what the people of israel are you know they are circumcised only outwardly and he says they are not the jews who are circumcised outwardly in the flesh verse 29 but he is a jew 
which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. So God is recognizing only those who are circumcised in the heart in the spiritual way. God does not have regard to those who are circumcised outwardly as the Jews do even till this day as God gave the commandment to Abraham and since that time it has become a symbol of them being God's children. Circumcision is a mark of them being called God's people, isn't it? All the way it has been so. On the eighth day a male child is taken to the temple and the foreskin is cut off. But he says here that our hearts must be circumcised. It's not just cutting off the foreskin, but we have to cut off the evil desires from the heart. That is the one thing which God will praise and God will recognize. So, based on these verses, very clearly we understand that just being born a Jew, just because they practice circumcision, they cannot claim to be God's chosen people. And in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, we clearly read that just because they are in Israel, can they become really Israelites. See that in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. Not as though the word of God has taken an effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. There you see. You see, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Just because geographically they are in that place of Canaan or promised land, can they become Israel, he says. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they children. There you see, they do not become children just because they are physically descendants of Abraham. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So here he goes on to compare with Isaac and Ishmael. Brothers and sisters, we all know the uh, story of Isaac and Ishmael. So how Isaac was born, how Ishmael was born. So here what is saying is that Isaac was the one born because God promised Abraham, because of promise. But Ishmael was born in a fleshly way. And that's what he is comparing the Jews of the present day to Ishmael. They are just descendants of Abraham in a physical way, not because of the promise. Because the promise was uh, through the seed and the seed is Christ. And because they are not in any way attached to the seed, they are not really the children, he says. They are just like born in the fleshly way. Maybe you remember the story very well. God uh, called Abraham. God said, I'll bless you, I'll multiply you, I'll make your seed like the stars of heaven, sand of the seashore, and through thy seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. And all God gave them a promise. But it was very long time before that was answered. In fact, it took almost like decades. And then meanwhile what happened is Sarah had become too old and it had stopped being with her as the manner of woman who can bear child. And Abraham also had become very old. And she came up with the idea and she suggested to Abraham that he take one of their bond servants and through her give her a child. And Abraham agreed and they took Hagar and through Hagar Abraham had a child and his name was called Ishmael. We know that. Now this is totally their own doing. God never asked Abraham to do that. God never asked Sarah to do that. They did it of their own, see, their own fleshly minds and fleshly way. And Ishmael was born, 
in a natural way. But Isaac was not born like that. You know, later on, God appeared to Abraham and said, Sarah will have a son and uh, I will bless him and make him a blessing and all that. You know what Abraham did? Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said unto God, I am so old and Sarah also being so old, I am 100, she is 90. How can we have children? Let Ishmael be the seed. Accept is Ishmael and bless Ishmael only. But God would not have it. So God clearly said to Abraham, it is not Ishmael. Sarah will have a child for you. And you shall name him Isaac and that is the person I am going to bless. So now that's what happened we know in the story. So like that here Paul is comparing the fleshly Israelites to Ishmael. They are born in a fleshly way but those who accept Jesus Christ to have believed in him and are baptized into him are born in a spiritual way. And therefore he says we are the real Israel of God and we are the chosen people and they very clearly see that in verse 28 of chapter 4 after talking about Ishmael and Isaac and all that he compares them to two covenants you see we can read from uh, chapter 4 of uh, Galatians yeah Galatians chapter 4 verse uh, 22 onwards for it is written that Abraham had two sons the one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman so the bondmaid was Hagar who was a lifelong slave in the family and Sarah of course was not a slave she was free and verse 23 but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh but he who was of the free woman was by promise that is Isaac Verse 24, which things are an allegory? Now he says, all these things are figurative. For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which generates to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. There you see the comparison. The two women there are two covenants God made, he says. He compares them to covenants. Marriage is a covenant. So, one is Hagar, the bond woman. Another is Sarah, the free woman. And then he says, Ishmael was born to Hagar. And that is comparing to the covenant God made with Israel in Mount Sinai in Arabia. We all know God brought them out of Egypt and in Sinai God made a covenant with them by giving them the law. That is called the law covenant. So that is the marriage between Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael are the physical descendants of Abraham. All the people who were at Sinai, they are compared to the physical Israelites who were there living in Jerusalem at that time. He says very clearly, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth or refers to Jerusalem which now is. So the Jerusalem which now is means in times of writing of this epistle, there was this Jerusalem and these were the physical Jews. And the same Jerusalem, there are the same Jews even living today also. Even now there is Jerusalem and they are the Jewish people. Now, he says, Hagar is the law covenant and the people who are born out of that covenant are the physical Israelites who are in Jerusalem now. And he says, they are in bondage with their children. Bondage means what? Bondage to the law. They are bound to the law. They are God's children because of the law. If you keep this law, you will be my people. So they are bound to the law. 
unless and until they keep the law they cannot be god's children so that's how he compares uh, the fleshly israelites who were then living in jerusalem to ishmael born from agar now in verse 27 uh, 26 he says but jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all <laughs> so he says jerusalem which is above So Jerusalem, which is now here down on this earth, but he, here he is speaking of Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Means us means Christians. So he is saying we are born to Sarah, the free woman. We are Jerusalem, which is above, and verse twenty-seven. It is written, "Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not; break forth and cry that." travel us not for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath husband so there you see in the story though sara was the wife she never had a child but hagar who came in later she had a child first and ishmael was living in the house and all this period sara was still barren but sara was to be more blessed than those who had children like hagar why though she waited she was the one who gave birth to the promised seed and that seed only got blessed so that is what he is comparing and verse 28 he says now we brethren as isaac was are the children of promise so there you see now we means christians who believe in god and have this spiritual circumcision we are as isaac was the children of the promise so very clear he says not the fleshly israelites they are in bondage to the law they answer it to jerusalem which now is but we are of the jerusalem which is above we are of the free woman and then he says we are as isaac was the children of promise so very clearly brothers and sisters first ishmael came and then later on isaac came like that he says first the fleshly jews came out through the law covenant and then later on the spiritual seed came through christ so uh, ishmael and isaac is comparing very clearly and shows us that the fleshly israelites are like ishmael but we who have faith in god and become god's children through jesus christ are the spiritual israelites and therefore they say that we are the chosen people and flesh benefits nothing and those who are jews only outwardly are not jews or at all and So therefore we are the ones who are the heirs and so on so this is the replacement doctrine now there is a second line of thought which seems very similar but it is actually very different and that is called the covenant doctrine now the covenant doctrine what it says is that god did not replace the fleshly israelites with the christians now what they say is that this replacement never took place that the fleshly israelites were not rejected and the christians were not taken in their place but rather what they say is that god had some people in israel who believed in jesus and it is with them only that god established his new covenant so what they are saying is that god did not reject them and accept the christians but rather that god established his new covenant with the jews only so it was not a replacement but it was a renewal of the covenant those who were already god's people 
of them who believed in Jesus, with them only he started the new covenant. So because of that, it is not replaced, but it is continued with the Jews only. And they are very logical in their argument. Because what do we see in the scriptures also? With whom did God enter into a new covenant? It was with the Jews only, isn't it? Jesus himself was a Jew. And then all the apostles whom he chose were Jews. And the early church, most of them, the main people, the main body of Christians were Jews only. They were Israelites only, fleshly Israelites only. With them only, Jesus established his new covenant. Isn't it? Even in the Last Supper with his 12 Jewish apostles, he said, he took the cup and said, this is the blood of my New Testament, the new covenant which I established with you with my blood, he said. So they were all Jewish people. And when the Holy Spirit came down upon them, and the 120 people praying, they were all Israelites, fleshly Israelites only. So according to the covenant doctrine, God did not remove them and bring in the Gentiles, Christians, but with them only, God established the new covenant. And later on, the Gentiles were also given an opportunity to be included with them in the new covenant. Now, that is very scriptural and reasonable, isn't it? And that is what the same Paul, who till now in other verses we saw, he was emphasizing on the spiritual circumcision, on faith, and we being God's children because of faith and all. Now, he only clearly shows us that this happened with the Jews only. Now, all that we read earlier is truth. What the replacement doctrine people use the scripture, that's all truth only. God accept those who believe in Christ and who are spiritually circumcised and all that. They are the real chosen people. But the Jews were those people to start with. The Jews only believed first. The Jews only were spiritually circumcised. And the Jews only became the main body of the church. So, they only became spiritual Israelites. Later on, the Gentiles were slowly added. Now, of course, after some time, more than the Jews, it is mostly Gentiles who are in the church. But the very core of the church were all Jewish people who had believed and who were baptized into Christ. So, all that we studied in the first part about the replacement doctrine, technically it is true, but now that was being fulfilled with the Jews only. They were not replaced, they were not cast out and replaced by the Gentiles. No, that is what we can clearly being explained to us in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 onwards. I said then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid! See, you see. He's asking the question and he's saying, that is not the case. As God cast away his people, God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul is saying, God has not cast off the people of Israel, because I am also a fleshly descendant of Abraham, and in particularly he says of the tribe of Benjamin. In verse 2, God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. So, God has not cast away. So, according to replacement doctrine, God has cast them off and God has taken us in. He says here that is not the case. God has not cast them away whom he foreknew. What is not what the scripture saith of Elias? Now, he's comparing what happened in the time of Elias? That we can 
read very clearly here how he maketh intercession to god against israel saying lord they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars and i am left alone and they seek my life now the situation in israel was such that jezebel was married to ahab ahab a wicked king who did not care for god he had married a gentile woman jezebel and together they had completely replaced the worship of jehovah with baal worship they had broken down all the altars of jehovah and built altars to baal and they were worshiping baal and that is how the situation was in israel so you know the story this is i am left alone and they seek my life i am alone <laughs> faithful to you now they all have gone astray you know what god said in verse four but what said the answer of god unto him i have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed their knee to baal so god said you are not the only one left i have reserved seven thousand men who have not worshipped baal so he says comparing that to the present times of paul he says even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace so he is saying though all the people of israel have rejected jesus christ and crucified him and refused to accept him even after resurrection yet there is a remnant he says like the 7000 at that time here a few thousand whom god has preserved unto himself so that they may receive the grace of god and what's the grace of god the forgiveness of sins and the opportunity to become part of the seed the spiritual seed the real seed promised to abraham so that is what happened here and if by grace then it is no more of works otherwise grace is no more grace but if it be of works then it is no more grace otherwise work is no more work so what he is saying is generally israelites they still believed in works works of the law it is they were trying to be acceptable to god by keeping the works means the law but by law no one can be justified it was impossible and that's why god sent his son and his son kept the law and he died for us and now whoever believes in him god is offering grace and forgiveness and righteousness just for believing now that grace can be given only to those who believe and that's what happened in israel though all israelites they were believing in their own works yet a remnant is this he says uh, a remnant according to the election of grace means it was god's election it was according to god's choice that some were able to accept christ to believe in him and to be baptized in, into him and become god's children and therefore become the core of the seed of christ and verse seven what then israel hath not obtained that which it seeketh for but the election hath obtained it and the rest were blinded so a few people got elected or selected and gave them this grace and the rest were blinded he says so in essence what he's saying is that not all israel were rejected or cast off because first god had selected a few a remnant and through them only he established his new covenant through his son through his blood and then to that covenant gentiles were also invited to join in so according to this very clearly it was not like totally they were cast off and totally new people were replaced later on but it was through them only that god established the new covenant and what happened to the rest 
and according as it is written god hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day he continues so the rest were given a spirit of slumber and they could not believe and and all that so very clearly brothers and sisters uh, so that being the case god was actually showing us mercy in causing the rest of the israelites to become blind to the messiah who came to save them because if all israel had accepted christ and become god's children spiritually then where is the chance for the rest of us to become part of his body we all know that the seed is having head and body the head is jesus and a body was to be selected to be associated with the head to bring in the blessing now a remnant in israel became part of that body but the rest were blinded so that the gentiles who believed in christ could fill in and complete the body of christ and god purposely caused the rest of the israelites to become blind he sent them the spirit of slumber so that we could have a chance to get inside the body of christ otherwise you know what would have happened they all would have accepted christ and the required number of people to be the body of christ would be filled with all the jews only and then gentiles would have no part in it like as in the previous study we saw about the seed of woman and seed of abraham with jesus as a head and the body and the particular number of people to be in the body is also mentioned the book of revelation as we know it is 144000 who were with the, the lamb so if all that sufficient number was found in israel which would have been found if god had not prevented that then where is the chance for people like you and me to become part of the seed of god so that is the reason god himself he says according as it is written god has given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day he says unto this day means until paul's day and we can say unto our day also unto this day the spirit of slumber eyes they cannot see they are living right in the same place but still not able to accept that the messiah was jesus himself see that is because god has put them in blindness as in verse 9 also we read david said let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them let their eyes be dark and that they may not see and bow down their backs away you see brothers and sisters that is what they are doing because it is is already written in the prophecy and that is being fulfilled so there is no way that they can escape that situation and now why did god do all this it is as we read in verse 32 for god has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all why did he conclude them all in unbelief so that he might have mercy upon all means all the rest of us so he wanted not only the jews to be the part of the seed he wanted even the gentiles who believe in christ to be part of the seed and that is why god began to open up the doors to the gentiles through cornelius and through that ethiopian eunuch and later on gentiles were invited given the heavenly call to accept christ to be forgiven of their sins and to follow Jesus and to be partakers with him now in suffering and later on in ruling with Christ so brothers and sisters that is the doctrine of covenant and as we see that uh, he goes on to explain this more clearly in the same chapter in verses 
16 onwards if you should see Paul is very clearly comparing Israel to the olive tree and then he says the fleshly Israelites they are the olive tree and then we Gentiles we have been grafted into that same tree see that in verse 16 for if the first fruit be holy the lump is also holy and if the root be holy so are the branches so he's talking about the root and branches here and verse 17 and if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree now what he's saying is the fleshly israelites are the olive tree you see they are the ones who have come from the roots up you know the root means their forefathers and the covenants God made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and all that is the root of the olive tree. From that foundation only this tree has come up. The tree refers to the Jewish nation. But then he says some of the branches were cut off and then you means the Gentiles you were grafted in. Now, what he's saying is that the tree itself was not uprooted and another tree planted in its place, like the replacement doctrine people believe, but rather he says that the root is the same, only some branches were cut off. Not all the branches, but a few branches were cut off and the Gentiles were grafted in. That's exactly what I was telling you before that the new covenant is with the people of Israel and then God caused the rest of Israelites to be blind so that he could include the Gentile converts also in that part of the seed. So exactly as we see here the branches were cut off and he says you being a wild olive tree you know that means we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel Israelites were the ones to whom the promises were made. They were the ones with whom covenants were made by God. All the prophets were sent to them only. The law was given to them. Even Jesus Christ came to them only. So they are the root and stump of the tree. Now we were all aliens. But he says we were grafted into that olive tree and then verse 18 he says boast not against the branches but if thou boast thou bearest not the root but the root thee means you don't boast against the branches which were cut off because you are not the root you are only a branch the root is bearing you up you are not bearing the root thou will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in that's how Christians speak you know they were cut off. They are unbelievers. They have no part or lot with God anymore. That's how they speak of the Jews. You know, and they boast themselves as we are the spiritual Israelites. We are the chosen ones now. All the promises belong to us. That's how they boast. But here he is saying, Thou will say then that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And in verse 20 he says, well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded by fear. So, when the Christians, you know, boast themselves that they are the ones who are chosen of God and not the other, as he's saying that, they were cut off because of unbelief. And you are grafted in because of your faith. That's all, not because they were not good enough or that you were better than them the only reason God cut them off is because of their unbelief and the only reason we are grafted in is because of our faith not because we are for goodness or anything not because we are better people or anything just because of faith and therefore he says be not high minded but fear so we have to be careful when we speak about the fleshly Israelites 
you know, though God has given us this grace, we should be humble and be thankful. And then he says, if God spare not the natural branches, take it lest he spare not thee. <laughs> See, if God did not spare the natural branches, cut them off. How careful you should be that you may be cut off. That's what we should realize uh, because nobody is indispensable. You know, we should be thankful for the opportunity God has given us to be part of the body of Christ and be able to receive God's gift and Holy Spirit and to be able to speak his words and to receive his promise and all that. We should be very thankful and humble, but we should not boast against Israel because none of us is indispensable. He can remove us and bring in someone else. He can bring the same Israelites back again, he says, and that's what here he says. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity and towards the goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. You see, both the severity and goodness of God we see. God was hard on them, but good to you. So, you recognize that goodness and continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off also. And verse 23, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. And God is able to graft them back again. So very clearly what we are seeing here is that they were not cast off and replaced by us, but only some of them cast, got cast off. But the root and the stump is still the fleshly Israelites. And the fact that they are cut off also is not permanent, he says, because God is able to graft them back in. Now, that leads us to the third line of thought. Now that is very important because now we learnt about the replacement doctrine and some truths in it, but then it is not replacing Israel by Gentiles, but it is replacing Israel with those believing Israelites. And uh, later on about how the Gentiles were also included in the same covenant with them. Now, this is all fine, all right, very wonderful. In fact, the plan in which God caused some of them to be blinded and so that he could include the Gentiles also is wonderful. But now the question comes as to what about the rest? What about those who were blinded, the entire nation of Israel? to whom God gave them the spirit of slumber, that they should not believe and see and hear and all that. What about them? The fleshly Israelites, what about them? Now, that is where the dispensational theology comes in. Now, that is the third line of thought is very important. That is all conclusive actually. That will conclude the matter and make it very clear to us. That is that what God did at one time in to one people is not the same what he would do at other times. That is called the dispensational method of Bible study and we have included that in 10 methods of Bible study. It's called the dispensational study. At one time God did in one way, the same God may do it in a different way in other times. Though God is always unchanging, the ways in which he will deal with people keeps changing or progressing as we have clearly explained in that method of study. So that is what we can apply here in respect to Israelites, the natural Israel, the spiritual Israel and how everything fits in will be easily understood when we look at that from the standpoint of dispensational study. And for that I will show you in a simple chart and we will understand very easily how God's plan has been progressing through the dispensations. Well, this is the chart. Brothers and sisters, 
in this is called the three worlds the world that was from creation up to the flood and after the flood up to the second coming or the end of this world this is called second world and afterwards of course the new heaven and new earth after our lord returns now in these three worlds we know the first world ended without uh, any difference they were all one people but later on is a time when all the people began to multiply god selected one man abraham and made this promise to him and to his seed and his seed isaac jacob and the people of israel and later on they become the nation of israel with whom god made a covenant and and from then on he said they were the chosen people and god began to give them the law and protect them fight for them and give them the most favored status of all the nations and that is the time we call as the jewish age you see the jewish people that's where the tabernacle was given the priests were given ceremonial laws were given by which they could be cleansed from their sin and all that and that is called the jewish age and that was up until the time christ came jesus was born and later on he was crucified and as we said he is the actual seed that was promised to abraham and and since then a new age began that we call as the gospel age or the age of grace now this jewish age is called the law age or law period now after christ came the grace period came so we are accepted by our faith as we read by grace are you saved through faith it's by grace only not by our works so previously it was all through the works of the law and that was not able to bring salvation to us and that's why god sent jesus and since then that is a time of the new covenant all those who are sanctified by the blood of jesus christ are now with whom god is dealing with so there was a time when god was dealing with only the jews the people of the fleshly children of abraham but then that came to end when christ came and died and ever since god is dealing with the church you see as we have explained very clearly what the different parts of the church or the four divisions of the church you may want to look up in our playlist you'll understand church means who all are there now god is dealing with them to choose from among them those who will be faithful to him so that is was going on for the past 2000 years that was going on so about roughly the same period was the jewish age and uh, that that is when the jews the fleshly israelites were god's chosen people but then after isaac was born you know can compare to ishmael and isaac the fleshly jews to ishmael and then the spiritual jews are christians to the isaac class so there was a time when ishmael was there he was the one the son in the house later on isaac was born and then what happened to ishmael ishmael was sent away you know the story isn't it when isaac was born now ishmael was he to be persecuting isaac and then sarah brings this up and send away this bond woman and her son and abraham was very sad about it but still god said do as your wife says so he gives her food and some water and sends hagar and ishmael away what happened they were wandering wandering here and there in the wilderness in the open blaze and without shade or shelter until all the food was drained up and they were on the stage of dying so that was the stage of the fleshly israelites they, uh, that was the situation in which the jews were during the gospel age because that time isaac was born god was dealing with isaac god was blessing isaac means isaac means the believing christians the believing jews or converted christians so god is accepted them and god is blessing them so meanwhile ishmael the fleshly jews 
they were in the diaspora they were scattered throughout this whole world as we know in all the ends of the earth they went off they did not have a homeland and wherever they went they were not able to be a happy lead a happy life because they were persecuted always seen as foreigners and 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 this hatred of jews were there antisemitism was everywhere and they suffered so that's how but now the dispensational doctrine is this that once the, the church is all chosen for this 2000 years now we are almost at the end of this period isn't it then christ will return and when christ comes back what will happen all the faithful ones will be raised and glorified those who were already dead right up unto that time and those who were remain they also the dead will rise and we will be changed as we know and then meet the lord in the air so the church is taken up then what god will do on earth who are the people with whom he will deal with and through whom he will bring blessing to all who are those it is the same people of israel who were cast away for a period temporarily until the selection of the church but once the church is gone up then god's grace will come again to the people of israel and as we read those who were branches who were cut off will be grafted in again very clearly he says isn't it verse 23 and they also if they abide not still in unbelief shall be grafted in for god is able to graft them in again 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 they will be grafted in again so they were for a time cast away but later on they were again restored not to a heavenly blessing but to a earthly blessing just like ishmael you see what happened to ishmael what happened he went on wandering until he was about to die he was on the verge of death did god let him perish no god saved him god caused them to see a fountain and god revived them god gave them water and what god said i will bless ishmael also god said to abraham god made a promise and likewise ishmael became great he also had 12 sons just like jacob he also had 12 sons and they became 12 tribes and god blessed ishmael in the story back in the old testament isn't it so likewise the fleshly israelites also will receive an earthly blessing the spiritual israelites will go for a heavenly blessing the fleshly israel will receive a earthly blessing after the spiritual israel has all been glorified first that is what we saw in galatians isn't it he talk about uh, jerusalem which is above and jerusalem which is now here below and this is beautifully explained to us in the promise god made to abraham what did god say to abraham in blessing thee i will bless thee and multiplying thee i will by multiply thee as the stars of the sky and as the sand of the seashore that's what god said there he clearly distinguished the seed of abraham and compared one group to the stars of heaven and another group to the sand of the seashore means one is a heavenly class which will be the spiritual class which will go to heaven only along with jesus they will be resurrected and be glorified and they'll go to heaven but that is not all because there is a sand of the seashore also abraham's physical descendants because god made a promise to abraham and his physical descendants isn't it god said in blessing thee i'll bless thee and i'll give you all this land for an everlasting inheritance he said your seed will possess the gates of the enemy and through thy seed blessings will flow to all the nations all this applies to the fleshly israelites also though there is a spiritual aspect which
was fulfilled through Christ and the church, physically also God made a promise. Isn't it? So, when God said, I will bless your seed and multiply them, he literally multiplied them also. And he made promises here on earth to the physical, geographical the place where to be taken and that place also was promised to them. So, that we can just see a couple of verses before we come conclude. That's in Genesis chapter 15, 18 where God is saying to Abraham, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed have I given this land. He's talking about this land means earthly land. So it has got a earthly promise also. The heavenly promise also is there as the stars of heaven, but also an earthly promise. Unto thy seed have I given this land, from river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Even the borders are mentioned here. And the same was repeated to Isaac and to Jacob that we see in Psalms chapter 105 verses 9 to 11. 105, 9. Which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law unto Israel for an everlasting covenant. It was an everlasting covenant. This land will be yours forever. And there are so many scriptures and promises or God made in several places that God will bless the physical descendants, that they will possess the land, and that they will dwell there, that they will be planted and not rooted up from there. And they, every man will sit under his vine and fig tree and no one will be make, able to make them afraid. All these were physical promises to physical children of Abraham. So that will again come into place once the spiritual children are all glorified. So that will happen when Jesus returns. So when Jesus returns, the church will be lifted up to a heavenly blessing and then on earth, the Israelites, the fleshly Israelites will be the first to receive the blessing of God's kingdom. Because when Jesus returns, where will he return? Will he come down to America? Or will we come to Canada or Australia or Germany or France or India? Where will he come back and land? He will land in Israel in Jerusalem on the very mountain from which he left. We read, isn't it, the prophecy, his feet will come and stand on the Mount of Olives. I'm talking about olive tree and root and stump and branches and all that. And interestingly, that olive mountain only he will come back. And then what will happen? Beautifully, we see the conclusion here talking about Israelites, how they were given the spirit of slumber and God severely dealt with them. They experienced God's severity, all that God did so that he could give us an opportunity to be in the body of Christ. He, all that he explained and later on what he says, see here in Romans, verse 23 onwards, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So God, he says, God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. <laughs> so what God is saying that you who be a wild olive tree or branch, you were grafted into this tree means, they are the natural branches. How easily they will be grafted in again. Because just imagine brothers and sisters, we were so far away from God. Like the story of Lazarus and rich man, we have already taken that up and you can see that in our study on 
what happens after death it one of the classes we have talked about the rich man and the lazarus so rich man who was a rich man they were the jews they were god's chosen people for a long time rich of god's blessing the most favored nation in all the earth but when christ came what happened since because they were not able to accept christ they went to hell hell means torment so for 2000 years they went to torment but until that time when the jews were being blessed by god we were the, we gentiles we were like lazarus we were full of wounds and with the dogs but then once we accepted christ now our time came in we went to abram's bosom so now we are god's children but this will also end you see god caused them to be blind and not accept christ and to be in unbelief why because he wanted to give us the chance to be god's children but once that required number of god's chosen people are all gathered and they are uplifted with christ christ when he returns then you know what will happen he will bring back his favor to the jews he will bring back the jews to the same place and then bless them again so that is what very clearly we see here for he says verse 25 for i would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery now that is a mystery brothers and sisters what we are about to see is it's a mystery which many christians up until today they do not realize the mystery is that god has plans for israel again the fleshly israelites though they were cast off for a season but once jesus returns then favor will return to them that's what we see he says i would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part is happened to israel until the fullness of gentiles come in that's what i said blindness in part has happened to israelites until the gentiles the fullness of gentiles the church class be fulfilled once they are all gathered and taken in then you know what will happen we read again that blindness in part is happened to israel until the fullness of gentiles come in and so all israel shall be saved so he says and so all israel shall be saved he's saying all israel will be saved how many christians know about this we think salvation is only for us and the jews they rejected christ and they are gone forever there is no more salvation but here very clearly he says that all israel will be saved how they were rejected because of unbelief isn't it now god will do something to cause them to believe in christ and that's what we read as it is written there shall come out of zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from jacob there you see and this is my covenant unto them when i shall take away their sins so who is this deliverer one deliverer will come from zion and turn away ungodliness from jacob that ungodliness is still on them even till today they still as i said in the start of this message i said how ungodly they were how disrespectful of god and jesus they were they are till now but the deliverer will come and change that ungodliness take away their unbelief and once they start believing their sins all will be forgiven brothers and sisters and you and i know who the deliverer is the deliverer is jesus coming from zion means coming back from heaven from where he has gone coming back to this earth and when he returns and lands in israel then all israelites their eyes will be opened they will realize that the one whom they killed their forefathers killed is the real messiah indeed 
and that they were mistaken and they will turn unto God. And then God will save them and then God will bless them. Right now, you know, the thing that is happening is they have to first conquer the gates of the enemy and then they will be blessed and then thereafter blessings will come to them. Isn't it? That's what God said to Abraham when he made this promise in Genesis 22 that in blessing thee I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea that is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. So, and then afterwards and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So, before all the nations of the earth can be blessed through the seed of Abraham, they must possess the gate of his enemies. And that exactly is what is happening in Israel right now. Because all the Arabs, they hate the people of Israel. Though God has brought them back and settled them in their own land, all this is part of God's promise being fulfilled. Yet they don't recognize it and they don't want them there and they hate them and, and they are all united in destroying the people of Israel. And that is their latest effort is one of that, how they attacked Israel, how they attacked the civilians and all that. Now Israel is fighting back, is defending itself and taking control that exactly is that they should possess the gates of their enemies. But after that, blessings will come. Right now, bombs are going out from Israel. See how every 30 seconds, they are bombing Gaza at one stage. That's how bombs and destruction is going on now. Everybody is seeing Israel as a culprit, bringing curses and destruction and sorrow to the people of Gaza and all about. But this is just beginning of God's fulfillment of promise and there afterwards blessings will also come. They should be blessed for first and afterwards blessings should through them go to the entire world. So how this and all will transpire we will see in our next class when we come to the present situation how this will going to act and what are the prophecies of God regarding what is going on now we will look up in our next class, God willing. Until then, God bless you.